What's up dudes, thanks for tuning in for today's video. Whew, we got a lot to go over. We did some CFD testing, we drew some new stuff on the whiteboard, we went over project priorities, project goals, and it's all getting pretty bona fide. Not only that, but all of these files that we make are gonna be available to you for free soon, because we're going open source with this thing. Let's get right into it. So that series of CFD tests got me doing a lot of thinking about what the core principles of this design really are. I wanted to separate them into kind of distinct categories. So we have design fundamentals, design goals, of which there's really only one and only, and then we're going to talk a bit about design restrictions as well. So I've outlined the fundamentals as having a math sensor, which is going to make the tuning a lot easier. The plenum is necessary to run the math sensor, so all the air can be coming in through one area and ITBs, because they're freaking awesome. So these are fundamentals. None of these things are ever going to change in the intake design. But what the goal is, the one and only goal for this system is to combine long tube performance with short tube performance. I don't want to compromise between the two, I want both. Whether that has to be a solenoid system, whether we can make it all solid state. So let's take a look at the design that we've already run through CFD. Now, what we found is that the air is more likely to take this red path than it is to go all the way around the outside of the plenum and in the runner on the backside, like we want it to. All right, so here's what happened. I used the wrong parameters when I made this first run of CFD tests, and I'm gonna show you what I did wrong. I was laying in bed one night and I was like, something's wrong with those tests. I don't, I don't know, it just didn't seem right. So it dawned on me hours later after I did these tests that I got skewed results. And I'm glad it did because it drastically changed the way the air was flowing inside here. Here's our inlet that's coming from the air filter. Here's our outlet that's going down towards cylinder four. This outlet has a volumetric flow rate attached to it. So the machine knows, the simulation program knows how much volume of air is leaving this port. Now the mistake I made was I put that same volumetric flow rate at my inlet, but the in inlet shouldn't have a volumetric flow rate. It's just exposed to open air. The correct parameter is to include atmospheric pressure at the inlet, which is one bar. Once I did that and ran the tests again, I got drastically different results, and we're going to see what those are right now. So here's our original design. What I think I'll do is I'm going to show you the changes I made to each design uh, so that you can recognize them easily, and then we'll go over the pattern that we're seeing here at the inlet before we dive deeper into how the air flowed inside of the volume. So here's our first one. This gap is about 5 millimeters, so quite small. Um, what else can be said about this one? The, oh, and this circle here is centered um, to about this point in the funnel. So the gap is clearly on the outside of the circle. Now, here's our first revision that we made. Uh, this is the biggest change, I would say. I moved the circle over so that the center could be between this wall and this wall. And I also opened this up to 10 millimeters. So that is our second revision and then our third third revision, or I guess this is the first, second revision. Anyways, version three, I opened this horn up. I, I cut it back a drastic amount so I can get a lot more air through this. Um, the gap here is still the same as it is in the other ones um, at this point, but um, the opening is clearly a lot different. It's easier to visualize this opening in SolidWorks so let me drag this over here. Yeah, that's fine. So you can see the, the hole's still the same size. Um, we just cut the front face of it back um, so that the air has an easier time attaching itself and, and rolling around. So that is version three. So let's go back to version one. Now let's talk about the inlet patterns. So you can see the air's moving pretty fast right here at the edge, but over here there's all sorts of weird chaotic patterns going on. Let's go to version 2. It says version 3 up here, but it's technically version 2. Similar story. You have a lot of fast moving air down at the bottom, but it looks like there's a lot of turbulence going on at the inlet tube itself, which neither of these look very good. Let's go to version 3, and it's, it's pretty smooth. You got faster moving air towards the middle, 
we have a nice gradient towards the outside. Um, and it looks like there's very little, if any, turbulence going on inside version 3. So, so far version 3 looks pretty promising. Let's take version 1 and cut it back a little bit. Let's show vectors. You can see the direction the air is flowing that way. And we'll cut it back to here. Here's where we see our first problem. This is the horn for, this is actually the horn for cylinder two. And we're getting a lot of air going up into this area, but it's not supposed to be being drawn yet. And we're getting pretty much zero air around the outside. Not good. So this is what I was talking about earlier when I said the air is more likely to wrap its way over the outside of this edge than it is to go around the outside. That is still the case for our version one, but thankfully we made a few changes um, and we, we started to improve that. So before we click out of here, let's show you one more thing. Let's look at our total total velocity exiting the manifold. So we're at eh, about two feet per second. Doesn't seem very fast, but um, I don't I don't really know for sure. I don't know how fast the air is supposed to be moving here. So I did some research and I couldn't couldn't figure it out. So if uh, someone wants to chime in on how fast the air should be moving here and how to use this simulation run to calculate our uh, efficiency, our loss of efficiency, uh, I would really appreciate it because I can't, I can't seem to figure it out. Okay, so two feet per second, nothing's going around the outside, a lot of air is escaping over this edge, we have a bunch of turbulence, not good. Let's cut this one back. Show vectors, and Our first problem appears even earlier than it does on the first one. This air is going backwards. It's going it's going the wrong way through this gap. It's going it's going towards the air filter um, down the main inlet tube um, before it wraps around and follows the the faster moving path at the bottom. None of that looks good at all. Uh, I forgot to mention this is one thing you couldn't see um, before. I brought this edge a lot further up um, to try to block the air coming in this way from the air coming in this way so that it couldn't wrap around as easily. I might be able to show you better in SolidWorks. Let me do a little cut here. So there, yeah, that's, that's what it looks like on the inside. Uh, these walls extend up into the funnel to try to separate the air um, and yeah, we'll see how well it works here. It worked, but um, now the air is moving backwards, so it didn't work very well. We just we have some crazy turbulence going on here. Like here, we're starting to get some air movement through there, but look how many different directions this air is going. It is it is awful. And then when we cut back to this section, the air is actually moving slower than it was. Even though this didn't get any flow this way and we lost a bunch of air over the, the top of this sharp edge, the air is still moving faster in our first design than it is in our second. So it's hard to say how much good we did or if we're even on the right track. So let's look at our uh, version 3. Okay, so we, we do still have some air escaping where it's not supposed to right here, but the good thing is we already have a lot of movement on the outside, um, and it's coming around back on this side as well, so that's a good sign. Um, this is a really good sign. This is the best we've seen um, of air coming around the whole outside perimeter. That looks really good. That looks promising. Um, we still have some escaping here, that cylinder too, that air shouldn't be going up in there, but I don't know how much we're going to be able to prevent that all in total, but we still have quite a bit of refinement that we can, we can do to this design. So this doesn't look too good. 
overall. But at least down here, we have a really uniform flow. There's no turbulence in this area, which is very good because these are, these are awful. The best thing is we're getting a lot of flow around the outside in the direction that we want it to go. So that is, that is an epic win as far as I'm concerned. Here is, and then here is right before it enters our cylinder four. And then the flow through cylinder four itself is, I think, pretty good. It's the fastest moving of all the other tests. Um, 2.5 feet per second doesn't sound very fast. Yeah, it sounds freaking slow because it is freaking slow. My mathematics were off by orders of magnitude. So I was out of my simulation runs for the free version of the SimScale software. So I made a new account with a different Gmail and ran it again with the correct parameters. And it still looks good. It looks great. But uh, now we got some more information and a lot more air moving through all of the ins and outs of the manifold. And this is what we got right here. It is looking pretty good. So according to this website here, um, the volumetric flow for the pipe diameter that we're dealing with, which is 45 millimeters, should be 200 feet per second of velocity through that. And when we go into our simulation, we have some red, which shows that these, these red vectors are moving 227 feet per second. So yeah, 25, what was it before? Two, two and a half feet per second? Yeah, that was pretty slow. It wasn't, uh, wasn't enough to keep the engine running before. But according to this, according to this math and this graph, it's flowing, it's flowing faster than it should. There is, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but from what I can tell, here, let's look at a different cut. Let's slice it this way. Look at the top. That way we can get in toward, it moves faster the further down it goes. So once we get right here, Come on, sneaking up on it, boom. So this area here, this one vector is going way faster than it's supposed to be. And if we change the scale a little bit, let's change it to 215. All of this is going 215, 215 miles an hour. It's supposed to be maxed out at 209. So, I don't know, man. According to everything I'm seeing, it's over 100% efficient, which doesn't seem right at all, but um, we're at least on the right track. I'm pretty stoked. I started asking myself what the, what the real reason is for making such an extreme bend, and, and we all know, I mean, it's pretty obvious, it's packaging restriction. I want it to fit in a certain space. Um, pretty much thinking about using it in a streetcar application, but we don't have a streetcar, we have a race car. So if there's anything that I want in this design that doesn't fit or doesn't clear something that's in the race car, I either chop it out and throw it away or just move it somewhere else because this I can do anything I want with this. So I think it's time that we fork this design into two different uh, development processes. This tube design, is I think it's, there's enough there based on the results of our fourth CFD test to show that I think if we continue refining this, I think we can get it to work. And the only way to get a long runner in a small package is to have an extreme bend. And for a streetcar, I think this would be um, awesome. And I think, I think we can do it. So this will be um, sort of where we start to develop our streetcar design from. And for the race car design, I thought of something completely different that's going to make use of all these principles. So the only reason, the air doesn't want to go through this small gap. It's too small. It would rather go up through here. It would rather run off of the backside of this sharp edge, go into other runners. It would rather create all sorts of turbulence than go through this gap. So 
instead of trying to make the air do something that it doesn't want to do, I thought, well, we need air here because um, we need to attach the air to this, this inside radius, right? So why don't we just bring the air in right here? What, what's telling us that we can only have one opening for air? Why can't we have two openings? So then I thought, well, for that matter, <laughs> once I thought that, I was like, dang, if we have two openings, there is a whole lot more that I can do with this that'll give us exactly what we want. What if instead of having one plenum and one intake manifold, what if the intake manifold were a Y and we had two plenums and we had ITBs and a single throttle body all working in conjunction? Just hear me out for a second. So this remains the same. We have a plenum up here. We have our air filter. This math is replaced by a conventional throttle body, but drive by wire, so it can be computer driven. And instead of getting a math reading from the air coming in this, we'll just get a, a vacuum reading from the entire plenum. And this throttle body will only operate at high RPM. So because it only opens at high RPM, we don't have to worry about drivability at low RPM or idle. This will only open when we're at wide open throttle, past a certain RPM figure. And then for our long runner design, instead of having to make this crazy bend, we'll bring the runners from the throttle bodies all the way out to here, almost completely straight, and we'll put another plenum uh, tucked into the, the inside of the fender here, and then we can use the headlight as an air intake. It's crazy, but I think, I think it'll work, and the air's gonna flow way better than having to make this extreme bend. And the only reason we can do it is because we removed all the stuff that goes in between here and here. Let me show you on the whiteboard. All right, if you didn't already realize, here's proof that this is raw, unadulterated development process. I wrote this down on the whiteboard, and I took a step back and I looked at it. I was like, something's wrong. I don't know, something seems, something's off about this. It took me a minute to figure it out, but uh, see if you can spot it before I point it out to you. The benefit of the ITBs are completely gone. When this butterfly is closed and this butterfly is closed, the engine's gonna pull a vacuum on this entire volume. So when the ITBs open, that air that comes in here, it has to fill this entire volume of air before it can enter the cylinder. And you've actually created more uh, throttle lag than you would have had if you just didn't have anything here at all because um, the air has to go the completely wrong way before it enters the, the engine. Um, this is actually worse, far worse than your standard um, OEM intake system. So um, the only way that we can make this work is if we take our drive-by wire uh, single throttle body plenum and introduce it over here rather than, rather than here. Um, let me redraw that and see if we can find any problems with that. Here's our fresh updated design. This is how it's gonna have to work if it works at all so that we're not creating a huge vacuum over here in this manifold. I've been staring at this for a while. Nothing's jumping off the page that tells me why this can't work in a really obvious way. So if you notice something that I'm not, let me know in the comments. But uh, yeah, the design kind of speaks for itself. You have your long tube design here. You have your short tube design here. One benefit is this can be quite short, so it only has to be long enough to get a good map reading on it. This might be a tuning nightmare. I have no idea. I'm not too well versed in the tuning world, but I'm going to do a little bit of research with people that are and see if this is a nightmare to tune. Cause I mean, it's so obvious. Like it seems like, it seems like there's no reason why it wouldn't be excellent, right? But they aren't, I don't see this, I don't see people doing this on race cars or production cars, so there must be a reason why. If it's simply because it's too complicated, then maybe there's a lot of benefit to be had, but there might be some other reason why this isn't being utilized that uh, we have yet to find out. So if you know of a manufacturer or a race team that has used a design similar to this, I'd love to do research about it, so let me know down there. Um, other big news on this project, I'm making all this open source. So as soon as I figure out how to write licensing terms and all that stuff, 
These files and the development data will be available for people to access and add to and contribute so that we can all make this better together and we can all learn together along the way. The street application is gonna be in a separate video, but that's also gonna be an open source project as well. If you want more information on how we're gonna collaborate on this stuff, check out the join button down next to the channel's name below. And I have a little bit of an intro video where you can get at least a general idea of what I'm trying to do with the channel memberships. So in this video, I don't wanna to go too far without your guys' input, so I'm gonna throw up a little bit of design ideas I have for specific to this race car design and see what you think. Let me know in the Discord, let me know in the comments, and we'll take it from there. Another thing too is all this stuff's new to me, not only the engineering side, but also the operation side too. So if any of you have legal experience and you can try to put me on the right track with the licensing terms that I wanna write for this open source stuff, I would be very appreciative. What I don't want to happen is I don't want some manufacturer to just take this idea and start developing it further, make money on it and everything like that without contributing anything back to the project itself. And what I also don't want to happen is for someone to take some of these printing files and make them on their own and it melts or fails in some catastrophic way and their engine explodes or something like that. I don't want to be responsible for someone's manufacturing choices for their own personal uses. So just putting it out there. So here's what I'm thinking. It's a pretty conventionally shaped manifold and there's a few questions that I want answers to before I do a lot of modeling on this stuff. So the first being the material choice for the manifold itself that's gonna bolt to the head. Um, since it's so short, it might not be too cost prohibitive to use uh, machined aluminum rather than 3D printing. That way we don't have to worry about plastic melting during an endurance race or anything like that. But 3D printing may still be a viable solution. So let me know what you guys think on that. We are going to have to make a custom linkage for the existing throttle bodies unless we find a new throttle body that's gonna work better for this setup. Because currently, in order to use the factory linkage on the Triumph throttle bodies, we have to put them really close together and the ports on the head are further apart, center to center, than the throttle bodies need to be in order for the factory linkage to work properly. So we're probably gonna have to um, do some kind of common shaft or that's gonna be a whole project in itself that uh, should, it shouldn't be too hard to do, but um, it's gonna be necessary in order to make use of the shorter manifold length. I had to make this manifold as long as I did so that um, when the air converged, it didn't converge at you know, such a drastic angle because they are they're pretty close together. Next question is diameter on the openings for the plenums. Go big or go home is probably the safest solution on this. If we just go three inches here, three inches there, we're not gonna run into any restriction problems. Although if we wanna optimize performance, we might want to decrease the diameter to increase the velocity of the air coming in. But um, I don't have an educated opinion on how much we should decrease the diameter of either one of these plenums. So if you do, I'd appreciate it. Also, the third question, so we got one, two, three, material on the manifold, diameter on the tubes, and whether we should have a soft bend here or keep it completely straight. So, which one's gonna flow air the fastest? I don't know, off the cuff, hard to say. It's really hard to say. Um, we'd probably have to test it to get a really definitive answer, but. If you have experience with aerodynamics, you'd probably know just by looking at it that one of these is gonna perform a lot better than the other. We have a lot of room here. We do have to change the air's direction 90 degrees from here to there. So is that better left up to the air to figure out which way it wants to go inside of here all by itself? Or do we help it make that uh, transition by bending these tubes a little bit? I'm not sure. That's all I got for today's video. I am excited to see what you guys respond and what kind of direction we have to go in for the next video where I am going to apply what I've learned in between now and then and we'll see how this starts to take shape. Make sure you don't leave without watching another.